Cedric, your genius is showing. Where? While 90s kids swear by their era being the golden age of Nicktoons, those of us who grew up in the 2000s have no shortage of memorable shows to look back on, but looking back, there were a lot of jokes that flew right over our heads as kids. I'm Keefe Nosi with Wicked Binge, and these are 2000s Nicktoon adult jokes, cleanest to dirtiest. By the way, we're gonna end with SpongeBob SquarePants because there's a lot of risque stuff happening down in Bikini Bottom. First, let's grant everybody's wish and start with the fairly odd parents, Cosmo and Wanda's godchild. Cosmo and Wanda's former godchild Mary Marianne was found in the Hall of Infamy in their fishbowl castle. The reason? You abused our magic, took out Archduke Ferdinand, and plunged the world into World War One. This implies that world conflicts are canon to the Fairly Parents universe. Timmy, you, you could have been doing a lot more to help. My dreams were shattered years ago. When Timmy accidentally steps on his father's tiny box of dreams, he reassures his child that his dreams were already shattered years ago. How many years ago? How old are you? You know whose dreams weren't shattered? Tinkleberg! Tickling the cha-chas, Cosmo apparently enjoys exploring his feminine fashion side. In the episode Anchors Away, he wears a skirt and comments on how the breeze tickles his cha-chas. Timmy, the breeze tickles my cha-chas! Male genitals are the implied joke here, but then you remember that Cosmo can also canonically get pregnant, so it might be more mysterious than we think. Not. Of course, given the fact that Timmy is a part of the Squirrely Scouts, it stands to reason that plenty of puns using the word nuts can be observed. I love big nuts! Let me blow your mind right now. Timmy's dad actually says, these nuts. Timmy, I love these nuts! Got <laughs> In one part, Timmy's dad comments that it's hard to keep nuts in your mouth when you're crying. This episode is also called Who's Your Daddy, so it's just trying to be weird. Oh, nuts. Oldest pun in the book, literally. When Tom Sawyer steals Cosmo and Wanda's magic wands, Timmy worries over what humorous yet terrifying alterations he could make to the universe. He could turn gravity into gravy, or planets into plants, or Uranus into... Oh my god! We gotta stop him! Therapy. When Timmy's dad is talking to a puppet version of his mom, Timmy's mature enough to understand how weird it is. Oh, sure, take his side. So weird that therapy won't ever help. No amount of therapy will ever make this moment okay. Under the Bed Monthly magazine, Timmy desperately wants the legendary toy known as Flipsy, so Cosmo and Wanda give him a magic copy machine that can bring images to life. That said, the ad for his wanted toy was in a magazine called Under the Bed Monthly, and considering the types of magazines you'd usually find under the bed, let's just be glad that Timmy's just interested in backflipping puppy toys right now. Croc blocked. Yeah, this is the actual title of an episode, Croc Blocked. Like, they literally just added a letter to cut. You, you know what, I respect the audacity. Maybe some dreams need to be broken. If you're one of the three people on the planet who still watched the series after Sparky was added, you might remember a concerning comment from Timmy's dad, leader of the Squirrely Scouts. When Timmy protests their usually deadly annual camping trip, his dad responds that it's tradition. Besides, if I drive a group of boys to the movies in this outfit, they'll arrest me. His certainty makes you wonder, has he done this before? Mr. and Mrs. Turner's bedroom life. Well, apparently something he hasn't done before is get a little more experimental in the bedroom with his wife. When he gives her a blindfold as an anniversary gift, she comments that she's wanted one for years. It's a blindfold! Oh, I've always wanted one. And something tells us they aren't just looking to get a pinata. Mr. Turner's wife is a freak on that note. Timmy's mom had it going on. On the topic of Timmy's mom, we can't skip over the episode where she decides to show Timmy her old swimsuit. Look, my old swimsuit still fits. Good for you, Mrs. Turner, but Timmy might need therapy after that. Cosmo had it going on? Well, maybe not, but on the topic of Timmy's mom's curves, let's not forget that time Cosmo literally got a boob job. Shame on you, Timmy. In the special episode, Information Stupor Highway, Timmy gets back at Crocker by sending a picture of him in a red dress to every computer in the world. Although it does make me feel pretty, oh well, at least no one can see this. Timmy's dad sees this and comments, you're not supposed to be on those kinds of websites! But that's my teacher! The bad parenting test. Timmy's parents are watching Dr. Bill's show on how to become better parents. If this isn't bizarre enough, his oddly specific criteria for bad parents are whether or not their child spends time in their room with a bunch of paper towels saying, don't bother me. I'm just gonna take these paper towels up to my room alone, so don't bother me! Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh... <laughs> I mean, at least he's cleaning up afterwards, I guess. The toy. Okay, there's literally a 0% chance they didn't know what they were doing here. When Timmy and Poof are taking a bath, one of the toys is shaped like this. Really? 
And just in case you think there's plausible deniability, it shoots toothpaste on Timmy's face. What? Why? Okay, we only have one radical entry for rocket power. Steroids. In the episode The Ice Queens, Otto's knocked over by a much larger opponent who he tells to Pick on someone with your own steroid dosage. Are you prepared for the incredibly evil next entry? It's time for Invader Zim. A quick jab at the execs. It's no secret that Invader Zim was far from Nickelodeon's favorite cartoon to promote. In the Christmas special, The Most Horrible Xmas Ever, show creator Jonen Vasquez got a little bit of clever payback when a child critiqued the robot snowman narrator's story for its logical fallacies. Why does he want to take over the Earth so badly? Which turned out to be almost verbatim feedback from Nickelodeon executives. We never deserved this beautiful show, did we? Zim's a little too excited. In one flashback, Zim commandeers a giant robot on his home planet, demanding his allies to twist some knobs and pull some levers. It's easy to miss weird innuendos like this, considering that pretty much everything Zim says is already super bizarre. Slurs for humans. More good examples are Zim's various slurs for humans. Some of our personal favorites are frolicking dirt child, filthy slug, and the classic dib monkey. Despite his huge head, the dib monkey is quite stupid. My head's not big! Jeez, Zim. We knew you were trying to conquer Earth, but you don't have to be racist about it. Stupid, stinking humans. There are a lot of horror references. Invader Zim is famous for two things. First, grr. Second, it's incredibly morbid sense of humor. Dad, there's an alien in the house! You mean besides you? From Zim going through an off-screen initiation in Invasion of the Saucer Morons to an entire episode about him stealing organs from children and replacing them with random objects. Oh, and we can't forget about Gaz's entire existence practically being an exorcist reference. Can't you see? I'm, I'm trying, trying to draw a little piggy! You don't want to know what comes out. There's one episode where a character named Squidman, who was a former officer with the brain of a squid, tries to squirt ink to assist Zim, but can't. He says that it's not working, and all that comes out is... You don't want to know what comes out. Judging by that white stain on the door, I think we know what he's talking about. Now it's time for our most intellectual show yet, The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. Bulby Stroganovsky. Among the weirdest characters in Jimmy Neutron is Bulby Stroganovsky, who's more of a product of his time than anything else. A burger, fries, and shake kebab. I'm just saying, a guy who's basically a bunch of weird foreign stereotypes in a blender being called an unknown species by a literal alien might not fly by today's standards. Regardless of the ethics, you can't deny that the slap, 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 clap, clap, clap song is a masterpiece like no other. Slap, 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 clap, clap. Many brains, few morals. It's easy to forget for a kid's show, Jimmy Neutron had very few morally upright characters. Even Jimmy himself wasn't safe from this, given how many times his inventions nearly destroyed the world or even qualified as crimes against humanity. Remember the episode where he made Sheen a literal megamind god of destruction? You dare to honor me? Carl's interest in Jimmy's mom. If there's one running gag in Jimmy Neutron that everyone remembers, it has to be Carl Weezer's constant infatuation with Jimmy's mom, Judy Neutron. It can be as innocent as serenading her after throwing a brick through her window, or as downright creepy as having her shrunk down and put in a jar. Hi, Mrs. Neutron. Those of us who have had our minds completely destroyed by meme culture are probably more disturbed by the latter. An interesting sponsor. In the special episode, Win, Lose, and Kaboom, host Meldar shouts out his sponsor, which happens to be... Tentacle Lubricant. Seems like someone's been watching the more unsavory types of anime, or some really weird SpongeBob SquarePants fanfiction. I won't judge. Hugh and Judy in general. Refreshingly enough, Hugh and Judy Neutron are actually a rare victory as far as cartoon parents go. They're genuinely supportive, mostly responsible people who love their son and each other. And believe me, they really love each other. Hugh, you're, you're so shiny. Yeah, you like what you see, baby? One of those games. There's one scene in particular where they allude to one of those special games, one that involves Hugh wearing spandex. You're spandex? I get it. You want to play one of those uh, special games, eh? Hey, whatever keeps things exciting for you two. The banana. 
And of course, we can't forget Hugh's famous line from his long-winded story. <laughs> Once when I was seven years old, I sat on a banana. And of course, that changed my life. Maybe Timmy can give Jimmy a reference to his therapist. But let's very quickly move on to my life as a teenage robot. Sex education. If having a chalkboard with birds plus bees equals baby written and drawn on it weren't suggestive enough, the teacher in this semi-aquatic classroom tells her class to open up to page 69. Any subtlety that could have been there is long gone. Okay, we're going ghost for our next entry, Butch Hartman's second most famous cartoon, Danny Phantom. Fun at the dance? In one episode, Sam is transformed into a giant phantom dragon, forcing Danny to take her down, and forcing Sam into a not-so-fun hangover of sorts. Wow, did I have fun at the dance? Briefs or boxers? When Danny's infatuated with the popular girl Paulina, his ghost powers decide to have a little fun by forcing his pants to involuntarily fall down. <laughs> Thankfully, Paulina actually likes his undies, so he leaves with a date and not on an offender registry. Danny Phantom, animal rights warrior. Danny manages to single-handedly save the purple-backed gorilla from going extinct when he discovers that one of the two remaining of the species is a woman. That's oh my gosh! Meaning that Danny just saw a gorilla's genitals. We've got the house to ourselves. With Danny and Jazz out of the house, for once, their folks have the whole place to themselves. We have the house to ourselves. I'll get the checkerboard! When Jack observes this, Maddie is immediately intrigued until he runs off to get a checkerboard, much to her disappointment. On a side note, the moms and dads in 2000s cartoons seemed to have the healthiest relationships with each other. Yeah, Dash called Danny this. Cartoons have always had some bizarre, usually silly insults thrown around by bully characters, but Dash takes it one step further in one episode where he calls Danny a twink. I don't know, maybe Dash is struggling with some ghosts of his own. Now that twink is out of the way. Tucker Foley, wannabe Casanova. Danny's buddy Tucker is always trying to get with the ladies, and this, of course, leads to the geek being embarrassed quite often by the ensuing rejections. That may be the hottest geek I've ever laid eyes on. One of the most memorable examples was the time he asked a delivery driver what she could do after hours. Just sign the voucher, sir. And let's not forget the time he wore a mistletoe hat to get a kiss from a girl, only to be Frenched by her pet dog while his eyes were closed. Nice! Grab your fire extinguishers, next is the legendary tale of Avatar, The Last Airbender. Aang's bathroom break. While in the home of a fortune teller, Sokka remarks that Aang looks like he had a fun bathroom break and quickly specifies, When I was in there, I don't even want to know. I doubt Aang even knows what he was talking about, but given Sokka's age, it's not too surprising that's where his mind went. Floozy. Back to weirdly direct name-calling in kids' shows, Meng sees Aang and Katara off when they leave to continue their journey, but she's also a bit more jealous of the latter than she lets on due to Aang's feelings for her, so she quietly calls her a floozy out of earshot. Floozy. Legalize the secret tunnel. I forget the next couple lines, but uh, then it goes... Secret tunnel! In the famous Secret Tunnel episode, the gang meets a group of obvious hippie slash stoner stereotypes. It's also worth noting that one of them compliments Sokka's underwear, to which he promptly scurries off. Smart move, Sokka. Toph's interesting training method. In an effort to provoke Aang to improve his earthbending, Toph steals a small sack of nuts from his bag. Give a pushover to do anything about it. She also takes a staff and proceeds to crush the nuts with it. It's a staff and a, a literal nut sack. It's a delicate instrument. It's not the only delicate instrument around here. The wonders of drugs. The cactus juice scene needs no introduction. Sokka getting absolutely high off the stuff is one of the most memorable scenes in the entire show, but let's not forget that time Aang was given some magic tea as a stimulant to try and get the Avatar state to come out. Aang, what are you doing? Crack. Shout out for our next entry having one of the most ludicrously catchy theme songs I've ever heard. The Mighty Bee. Honestly, just the whole show. The Mighty Bee isn't the kind of show that's known for a lot of sexual innuendos, which is good since its cast is mostly children, but we still feel the need to mention it for its extreme usage of gross out humor. Yummers! What are we having? <laughs> It's not hard to see how this show was inspired by the likes of Ren and Stimpy. As expressive as the animation is, it's no less full of absolutely vile moments that might even turn the most hyperactive kids over to another channel. Funny show, though. For the lead up to our grand finale, take a look outside. You might find some animals from back at the barnyard. Please, not the monkey dance. It's the furthest thing from a secret that Mrs. Beatty's husband is tired of her obsession over exposing talking farm animals. He's so tired, in fact, that when hypnosis causes her to insist that they go do the monkey dance, Stop the monkey dance! 
He's absolutely dreading it. Otis is questionable biology. Let's just get the anatomy question out of the way. Otis is a guy. He has udders that frequently squirt milk. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's quite pleasant, actually. It's like a gentle tug. I know it's a cartoon, but it's hard not to think about the fact that this male cow is spraying white liquid from his crotch area constantly. It's right here. It's right there. Otis's rectal exam. Well, I guess any doubt over Otis's gender was solved by the fact that he apparently needed a prostate exam at one point. If his trauma afterwards was any indication, it was far from a pleasant experience. Now, let's see what we got in the dairy section. Was there ever a more perfect scene for a finale? In this episode, Otis's old school bully contacts him saying he's coming for him, prompting Otis to remember all the times he forced Otis to come for himself. Seriously, this bully was a duck, so getting squirted by his own udders was the best case scenario here. What the, what, what's going on? Okay, finally, we get to Bikini Bottom. Let's talk about SpongeBob SquarePants. Practically everything Squidward says. This might not count as a typical definition of adult jokes, but it's worth mentioning. I don't like the notion that everyone becomes a Squidward as they enter adulthood, but I do love and completely agree with the idea that we only truly understand Squidward as we grow older. Whether it's his mourning of his dead hopes and dreams, or his frustration with the world refusing to give him any R&R, &R, Squidward is a mood sometimes, actually most of the time. Coming to bed, honey? Staying on a similar subject, when SpongeBob and Patrick try and break Mrs. Puff out of prison, SpongeBob recalls how wonderful adult life is on the outside. The traffic, the meaningless work, the failing, loveless marriages. Coming to bed, honey? Yes, dear. Man, when did this show get so existential? Shout out to SpongeBob for staying so dang positive, somehow. <laughs> Square pattern baldness. Okay, I want to start this off by saying that in The Sponge Who Could Fly, SpongeBob is confirmed to have hair, and by extension, insanely precise hairstyling skills. But when SpongeBob leaves Sandy's dome with the excuse of needing a haircut, Sandy isn't sure of whether or not he's got hair, and if he does, just where is it exactly? Krusty Dogs. The whole episode of Krusty Dogs is really just an excuse to have SpongeBob characters say wiener over and over. 12 inches of deliciousness. Not limited to Squidward's line of hoping Mr. Krabs' whole wiener thing will blow up in his face. Just make the wieners! Whether kids or adults, one thing is for sure, they knew their audience. Look at that guy just like a hot dog, Mommy. Let that inspire you to stay in school, Billy. Patrick, your genius is showing. In the episode Texas, SpongeBob praises Patrick's idea to bring Texas to Bikini Bottom by telling him his genius is showing, to which Patrick covers his crotch and asks, where? I'll ask the same question there. Does Patrick just genuinely not know where his genitals are? Nancy's pencil organization tips. SpongeBob's OCD kicks in during one morning of boating school, and he overthinks how to organize his pencils and notebooks. Thankfully, Nancy's kind enough to give him some advice when prompted, suggesting that one of the pencils belongs stuck inside your Squidward's making waffles. In Fools in April, when he attempts to apologize to SpongeBob for his cruel prank, he can't help but have his head transmuted into a sea donkey's and bray. And again, in Christmas Who, when he realizes how much of an absolute jerk he's been to SpongeBob despite his lovingly handmade gift, he feels like a, you know. Bye, Squidward. SpongeBob and Patrick are tasked with delivering Krabby Patties in a little submarine to the good people of Bikini Bottom. Upon being commissioned, SpongeBob says his goodbyes to Squidward, then to Mr. Krabs, then really says his goodbyes to Squidward, if you know what I'm saying. Hi, Squidward. For a guy who is asexual, SpongeBob has a weird way of making relatively normal comments sound strangely suggestive. Do you want it to hurt me, Kevin? Case in point, his encounter with Kevin C. Cucumber, his now former jellyfishing hero. SpongeBob will do anything for Kevin. Like, anything, anything. The coolest jellyfish enthusiast ever. He's more than willing to punch himself with a metal spiked boxing glove for the pleasure of this cucumber shaped neck beard. Do you want it to hurt me, Kevin? The balloon. Not to be confused with the great balloon theft of 2001, SpongeBob presumably didn't steal, I mean, borrow this balloon. He paid for it fair and square, but I'd say he really shouldn't be blowing his money on it. <laughs> Get it? It's funny, because it looks like it. Yeah, we won't even say it. There's a concerning amount of things in this series that look like this object, though. Oh, yeah. Sandy Cheeks in Bikini Bottom. Most of these jokes aren't too meta, but when you've got a town called Bikini Bottom and a character named Sandy Cheeks, and if we want to reach a little further, another character named Mr. Krabs, I mean, you can't expect us to not fill in the blanks, right? There's also another joke theory that SpongeBob is a tampon, but even I'm not buying that one. 
Bubble Bass's ad. In one of the newest SpongeBob episodes, Hot Cross Nuts, Bubble Bass advertises Sandy's barbecue nuts on his butt. Oh my god, there's no way to say that normally. Try Sandy's smoking barbecue nuts. The yellow fish's line, this guy's butt loves those nuts, does not help any. This guy's butt loves those nuts. Sailor Mouth. While it's not even remotely subtle, the episode Sailor Mouth is quite literally about SpongeBob and Patrick learning a square word from dumpster graffiti. Hey, Patrick, how the are you? Pretty good, SpongeBob. It's unsure which word this is, but it's a fun rewatch since there's no concrete answer. <gasps> did he just say, I, he did? They could be saying literally anything behind those dolphin chirps, and furthermore, this episode has more replay value than a AAA platformer. The good reasons to run around in colored undies. When SpongeBob and friends team up with Mermaid Man to bring the IJLSA back into action and stop evil! Evil? Mermaid Man reveals that superpowers are actually stored in their costumes. After all, why else would we run around in colored undies? Well, Squidward assures us that he has three good reasons for it. And frankly, that makes it a bit disappointing that he doesn't at least have the consideration to tell us even one of those reasons. Also notable is his reminiscence on his time at Makeout Reef. Ah, Makeout Reef. Good times, good times. How much you guys want to bet he made a few visits there with Squilliam? I'm just saying. <laughs> Extra Goofy Goobers. The older we get, the more we seem convinced that the characters in SpongeBob's world are mostly either stoned out of their minds or deeply mentally disturbed. In the SpongeBob movie, at least one of these theories is confirmed when SpongeBob and Patrick go on an ice cream binge at Goofy Goober's ice cream party boat. When SpongeBob wakes up, he's stumbling with a rough hangover to get to the Krusty Krab to call out Mr. Krabs for not giving him the promotion he deserves. Go off, little square dude, but maybe shower first next time. And now for the chaser. When Mr. Krabs flushes Plankton after yet another failed attempt to get his stubby little paws on the secret formula, he laughs heartily before claiming, and now for the chaser. And now for the chaser. Suggesting that Mr. Krabs is about to take a dump, which isn't that immature in and of itself, but there was recently the discovery of some lost media called Behind Closed Doors, consisting of vile drawings depicting SpongeBob characters. One example of these is the storyboard of the Now for the Chasers scene, in which Mr. Krabs actually took a violent on-screen dump. Really glad they cut that scene, personally. No, Mr. Krabs, it's that time of the month. A giant red blimp arrives with the Krusty Krab, the shadow of which makes Mr. Krabs question his old eyes. Squidward assures him that it's just that time of the month. Ladies, you know what he's talking about? Does it really look like a gigantic blimp, though? That's weird. Nasty Patty. This is as good a time as any to talk about the classic SpongeBob episode that was about SpongeBob and Mr. Krabs trying to hide what they fully believed was an innocent man's dead body they had killed from the police by burying it. Sorry, Mr. Krabs. I thought he might need some air. Honorable mention to the later episode, Out of the Picture, which sees Mr. Krabs repeatedly attempting murder on Squidward to sell his art for ludicrous prices. The mystery of the coin slot. SpongeBob's brief time with Mystery the Seahorse led to her tied up on the bike rack outside of the Krusty Krab. Scooter mistakes her for a kitty ride, somehow, and looks for the coin slot, only finding it off screen. I can't find the coin slot! Here it is! <laughs> and promptly being kicked away. Guess Bubble Buddy wasn't the only one to make him experience high tide, am I right? And why aren't you in uniform? SpongeBob's just too sweet to say no to Squidward when he's staying over during his time from being fired at the Krusty Krab. He's even willing to play along when Squidward demands him to dress as a maid while bringing him food and drinks. And why aren't you in uniform? He's not even doing it for laughs, he's just doing it to humiliate SpongeBob. Is this some weird kink of Squidward's? The world may never know, and I honestly don't want to. Did you want to? Patrick having a crush on Mindy in the Spongebob movie is fairly innocent. The same cannot be said of his reaction when Mindy walks up to the pair while his pants are down. Did you see my underwear? No, Patrick. Did you want to? If nothing else, it's great that Patrick had both kindness to offer and the consideration to ask before flashing her. What an absolute king. Now you get behind her and I'll push. The inner machinations of Patrick's mind truly must be an enigma to advise SpongeBob to get behind his grandmother while he pushes when that was nowhere in his plan to prove to her that he's grown up. Right. A man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. And then you get behind her and I'll push. The literal best interpretation of this is that Patrick had the urge to cripple an elderly woman, which really calls the big guy's morals into question just a little bit. Sexy crab car wash. 
No explanation needed. Uh, j just soak this one in. Really let it marinate in your brain. Acknowledge this is a canonical scene in SpongeBob and that Mr. Krabs does this. Side note, how often does Mr. Krabs borrow Pearl's clothes? Well, at least it's underwire. Uh, pretty often, I guess. Or he's borrowing someone's in the alternate universe where he's Bikini Bottom's main patty stealer. Not the way I use them. Eat particle chips. They're delicious. They are most certainly not delicious. Not the way I use them. Patrick, Patrick, sincere question. How do you use them? How do you use them? There's like a thousand ways I can interpret this, and the longer you leave me to my own devices, the worse they get. Please, please, give us the answer the world is begging for. The Incomplete Snow Mermaid. Man, for a couple little kids, these guys have some skilled artistic talent, huh? They sculpted this mermaid statue all on their own. Now all that's left are two more big round voluptuous snowballs. Who knows where they'll end up though? A seven mile spanking machine. SpongeBob's butt has been broken and he's got to be extra careful. That means no football with Percy who seems to be having a great time. It also means there's no participating in the seven mile spanking machine. Seven mile spanking machine, ah, ouch, ouch. Thankfully Squidward has no such injuries to worry about. Is this where the line starts? Either Squidward or one of the show's writers <laughs> was really into some stuff. The Squidward's ending it reference. In SpongeBob in Random Land, there's a blink and miss it reference to the infamous Squidward's ending it creepypasta. Oh, and not a one-off line or something in the background. They actually decided to flash a picture of the infamous red mist picture on screen. There's no telling how many children they traumatized with this. And there's no telling how many more they did when they replaced it with this. It's just a prank, bro. Mr. Krabs manages to wash the invisible spray off of SpongeBob and Patrick after they go around pranking Bikini Bottom. You'll see two naked guys fighting over a can of paint. <laughs> now call it sheer dirty mindedness, but this screenshot really emphasizes just how low paying the Krusty Krab must be. Model Sponge. Action! When SpongeBob thinks Mr. Krabs is firing him, yep, he's gonna have to watch. He searches for a new job and starts an acting career for a sponge commercial. SpongeBob's shocked expression upon hearing Use the pants! really tells you all you need to know. At least buy him a drink first. Jeez. The Sports Channel. I distinctly remember this one going over my head as a kid. In Your Shoes Untied, SpongeBob is watching a dancing CNM on TV, only to quickly switch to the Sports Channel when Gary walks in. I was just looking for the Sports Channel, Gary. I was always wondering why SpongeBob was so fearful of Gary's potential wrath over missing the big game, but it's clear now that SpongeBob was watching some naughty content. Absorbent, yellow, and apparently horny. Zee would you believe me if I said a one-time joke character in Karate Island is a metaphor for a condom? By this point, yeah, you probably would. Sandy has to fight the Tickler, a karate master who happens to be French. Yes, the French Tickler, also the name of a type of condom that basically turns your pee pee into a pom-pom. It's even weirder when you consider that his defeat comes about by Sandy chucking a tray of phallic jelly-filled donuts into his mouth until he can't hold any more. Sorry about the scabies. Um, <laughs> wow. This bakery had a cake specifically for apologizing about scabies. Do you want it or not? An infestation of flesh-eating bugs that can be transmitted as an STI. This reveals that STIs or STDs are apparently enough of an issue in Bikini Bottom for a bakery to just happen to have a cake apologizing for transmitting them. Also, note that the same bakery didn't have a happy birthday cake. Don't trap them. Every SpongeBob fan knows that Gary Takes a Bath is peak fiction, one reason being the brilliant scheme of a pirate treasure hunt to get Gary in the bathtub. Two pink soapy doubloons are his reward and Spongebob warns him to not drop him. Don't drop him. Squid baby. Uh, okay, I can't avoid talking about this episode for the grand finale. The episode Squid Baby is about Spongebob and Patrick babysitting Squidward, who believes he himself is a baby due to a head injury. It's clear from the adult diapers, poop jokes, and just everything that this has got to be some creepy, barely disguised fetish. It's not even a funny episode, it's just, it's just weird. It's the epitome of that era of Spongebob that just didn't care at all anymore. My face! Also my leg. I wouldn't be surprised if they just copy-pasted some creepy fanfiction for the script. 